Hi, I'm John McElroy. Welcome to today's presentation on departure tax when leaving Canada. What's this video going to cover? I posted a video earlier this week on tax and residency in Canada. The most frequent question or comment I received was, if you leave Canada, you become a non-resident, then what happens? I boil it all down to eight questions I want to take a look at in this presentation. Number one, when residents become non-residents, how is the date of departure actually determined? Number two, when is the departure tax due? Three, what property types are included in this deemed disposition and reacquisition at fair market value? Number four, what property types are excluded? Number five, can you defer taxation on gains that are generated from the deemed dispositions? Number six, does security need to be pledged? If a tax payment on the gain can be deferred, if so, what form of security is acceptable? Number seven, can the departure tax ever be unwound if you come back to Canada before you sell the property? And number six, what does compliance look like? The elections, the forms, the filings. We'll take a look at that as well. Now Canada, like most countries, has a departure tax. When you leave the country and you become a non-resident, why? Well, imagine the number of Canadians who would leave Canada for a lower tax jurisdiction after all their wealth had been accumulated in Canada, if there was no departure tax in Canada? Hey, Canada tax is based on residency, so we need a departure tax. In becoming a non-resident, you have a deemed disposition and reacquisition of all your included property at fair market value. Now, included property is only some property. There are important exclusions that we're going to get to. But let's turn to these eight questions. When residents become non-residents, how is the date of departure actually determined? Well, it's only possible to answer this definitively if you've made a clean break from Canada. If you want more information on what a clean break is, go to the tax and residency video. It goes into it in a lot of detail. But after a clean break, you become a non-resident on the latest of these four dates. The date you leave Canada, or the date your spouse or common-law partner leaves Canada, or the date your dependents leave Canada or the date you become a resident in the country that you settle in. Now, if you leave Canada and maintain some secondary and other ties, departure date is not going to be that easy to determine. Again, I'll refer you back to the tax and residency video. So when is the departure tax due? Well, you know what? Let's be honest. The term departure tax is a tiny bit misleading. After all, there is no agent from CRA at the airport checking passenger lists for immigrants. They can hit up for some kind of a departure tax. No, not at all. Departure tax is due just on the normal filing date, April 30th, on your last return that you file as a resident of Canada. So it's not even really a departure tax per se. It's just tax due on accrued gains from included property that you are deemed to have disposed. So let's remember this. Departure tax is not triggered by you moving to a new country. It's triggered by you becoming a non-resident of Canada. So what are these property types that are included in the deemed disposition and reacquisition at fair market value? Well, the charging provision under section 128.14b says taxpayer is deemed to have disposed of each property owned by the taxpayer. That's a very broad, inclusive language. It includes a lot. There are exclusions that we'll get to later, but what are the five main categories that are included in this deemed disposition? Well, the departure tax applies to the deemed disposition of private or public corporate shares of companies either inside or outside of Canada. The departure tax applies to mutual funds or partnership interests. Portfolio investments are included, government or corporate bonds. If you have an unincorporated business operating outside of Canada, that's included. So is personal use property of each item with a fair market value of greater than 10000 bucks cars, boats, RVs, collectibles, etc. I mean, the full list does include more uh, categories than just these five, but these are the five big ones. Now, private shares might pose a valuation challenge. Whenever you're faced with determining the fair market value of a property or asset, if it's something that's not frequently traded, like the share of a private company, there's going to be some difficulty in determining what its fair market value is. But the very same challenge applies to unincorporated businesses that are outside of Canada or even personal use property. So that is one hurdle you're going to have to overcome. So what property types are actually excluded from the deemed disposition? Well, there's four big ones. Let's take a look at them. Number one, 
real property situated in Canada is excluded. Sometimes these are referred to as the immovable properties. You know, your real estate, your house, commercial building, cottages. If it's real property in Canada, it's excluded. That includes resource properties and timber properties. So that's, a, that's important uh, exclusion. Number two, if you run an unincorporated business in Canada, maybe a sole proprietorship, that's carried on through a permanent establishment in Canada, your capital property, eligible capital property, the inventory of your business will all be excluded. Now, you can't game the system. It doesn't apply the exclusion to inventory you're no longer using in the business or inventory that you moved offshore outside of Canada. But for unincorporated businesses in Canada, you're covered. Number three, thank goodness this one's in there. Any rights and interests you have in registered products like savings plans, pension plans, income funds, education saving plans, profit sharing plans, retirement compensation arrangements, on and on it goes. These are all specifically excluded from the deed disposition. In fact, even this list is only a partial list. For the complete list, take a look at subsection 128.110 of the Income Tax Act. The last one is for the short-termers, people who didn't spend all that much time in Canada. Any property that was owned when or inherited after you last became a resident of Canada can be excluded on one condition, and that is you're, you were a resident of Canada for five years or less in the 10-year period before you emigrated. If you've only been here for a while, you can exclude the property that you owned when you came or inherited while you were here. Now, documentation is required, of course, to substantiate those claims. But what about included property where there is a, a gain? Can you defer paying the tax on the gain that was generated from the deemed disposition? And the answer is, yeah, it's possible to elect to defer payment of tax resulting from the deemed disposition until you actually dispose of the property. How that happens, we'll cover off in the last section. Does security need to be posted if the tax on the gain is deferred? Well, that kind of makes sense because if you have a deemed disposition and it creates a gain and you say, I don't want to pay the tax, but I'm leaving town, right? I'm gone. I'm now a non-resident. When you finally do sell the property, what ability does CRA have to collect? So they will ask you to post security in certain situations. The rule is, if the federal tax owing on the deemed disposition is over 16500 and that is for the 2016 tax year, yeah, security must be provided to CRA. So what does CRA consider to be acceptable security? Well, the big one is the pledge of the shares of the private or public corporation that are part of the included property. They'll accept a letter of credit, a bank letter of guarantee. In fact, CRA has boilerplate security agreements for the pledging of both public and private shares. Now, they might be open to a slight modification of the security agreement if it's necessary because of other security that you pledge in other places. You might get a minor revision through CRA, but I wouldn't expect anything major. Now, can the departure tax be unwound if you come back to Canada before you sell that property? The answer is yeah. If the tax on the deemed disposition that you deferred when you emigrate Hasn't been, hasn't been taxed because of the deferral. It can be reversed if you come back. You just need to file an election when you return to Canada. So what about the paperwork, the compliance, the elections that are made, forms and filings? Let's review that paperwork. Step number one, if you need help determining if you are a resident or non-resident of Canada, you know what? You can submit form NR73 and CRA would be happy to give you their opinion on whether you are or are not a resident. But I gotta be honest, a lot of tax practitioners do discourage clients from submitting NR73 because it's just swinging the door wide open to uh, CRA taking a look at you know every facet of your financial and tax life. Not that you're hiding anything, but most uh, tax practitioners don't feel it's wise to subject yourself to that detail to scrutiny. Number two, if you're becoming a non-resident of Canada, you must file that final tax return as a resident of Canada. 
That's where a lot of these forms are filed and these elections are filed as part of that final tax return. Number three, if the fair market value of all the property that you own when you became a non-resident of Canada exceeds $25,000, you know what? You need to fill out form T-1161, a list of properties by an immigrant of Canada. That's not discretionary. That's an obligation. All property more than 25000 T-1161 has to be completed. Now, the included properties from T-1161 that have an unrealized gain or loss stemming from the deemed disposition have to be submitted on Form T-1243 with a calculation of the unrealized gains or losses for each one of those properties. Again, this is not optional. If there are unrealized gains or losses, they have to be included on Form T-1243. Now, to actually defer tax that's owed on the deemed disposition of the included properties, obviously that's discretionary. An election is required. And that election should be made using Form T-1244. That's how we get the uh, deferral on the taxes owing. Now, if an election was made to defer tax using T-1244, Security must be pledged and security agreements signed. Again, if the federal tax owing is $16,500 or more, then you can request those security agreements and uh, work that all out with CRA. Here's a nice little feature that I do want to mention. Yeah, you have deemed disposition on these included properties, which could generate tax owing. But what if you have unrealized losses in some of the excluded properties? Just for an example, the real estate or resources or timber properties, etc. You don't have to include these, but what if you have an unrealized loss in them? Well, you can make an election using Form T-2061 to realize that loss. That's nice. It allows you to, or enables you to take the unrealized losses on excluded properties and use them to offset unrealized gains on included properties. So that's a nice little feature. Now, like most issues in Canadian tax, there is more to it than the basics we covered in this video. But as a follow-on to my tax and residency video, I wanted to summarize the basics on the departure tax just to get you started. I am John McElroy on departure tax when leaving Canada. If you enjoyed this video and got something out of it, please give it a like. Please subscribe to the channel. And that way you can be notified of all the new videos that come out. Uh, we really appreciate your comments. If you'd like to see other videos, let me know what they are. Uh, the more comments and inquiries we get, yeah, the more videos that we produce. If you need help on any of these issues, tax, residency, departure tax, etc., I am available. Uh, give me a call or email me. Email me sometimes the better way to get a hold of me. But I hope you enjoyed this video. And meanwhile, we'll see you in the next video.